Everybody, Anthony Gonzalez, certifiable teacher, back again. Uh, I want to talk to everybody about something today. Last video that I did was about literacy and trying to get students to be interested in reading, interested in reading for themselves. Well, I'm not going to talk about anything like that today. I want to get into something else. Uh, last Friday, September the 14th, depending on when you're watching this, last Friday a movie came out in theaters. Um, it was supposed to be a big blockbuster, supposed to be make a lot of money, a return to form for this franchise. It was The Predator. Okay, now I haven't seen the movie yet, and some of the reviews that I have read <laughs> tell me that it might be a wait for Redbox kind of movie, which is upsetting. It's sad because I like The Predator franchise, and I've watched all the movies, and I enjoy watching them. And so it's a little sad that this one isn't as good as it could be, especially because the, sh the director is a guy named Shane Black. Now, Shane Black is a director and a writer who's done other movies before in the past, and some are good and some are bad, but the point is he was um, an actor and a writer in the very first Predator movie. So people were thinking, oh, he's going to come along and he is going to kind of fix this franchise. Maybe it's gone off the rails. I don't know. But... Apparently it has not. It's not doing very well, or it's doing okay, but it's not a very good movie. Now, I'm not here to review the movie. Like I said, I haven't seen it. I'm not here to talk about it all that much. Now, if you, if you don't know what The Predator is about, and let's give a little story about it before we move on. The Predator, any of the movies, is about this alien who comes to Earth who wants to hunt anything that gives him a challenge. And so that means that in the first movie, the Predator came to the jungle and he hunted Arnold Schwarzenegger, 80s action hero. In the next movie it was Danny Glover and then it was Adrian Brody and then there are some other movies that people don't like to talk about. But the point is that they are all soldiers or cops or whoever and somebody you can find back. Okay, so the same thing is happening in this latest movie. They're soldiers, the Predator is on Earth trying to hunt them for some reason I don't know like I said I don't haven't seen the movie um but Shane Black the director has used in his movie a trope that I've been noticing a lot in Hollywood and at first it didn't seem to bother me as much as it does now now what is a trope some people some of you out there don't know what a trope is a trope is kind of like a cliche um, in regards to movies and sometimes writing as well. What does that mean? That means that if you're watching a Western, an old-time Western, the trope is that at the end, the hero is going to ride off into the sunset. Okay, it's a cliche. It happens all the time. You know it's going to happen, and it's kind of worn out. It's welcome. They're always making new ones, and they're always putting them in movies and TV shows and books and that sort of thing and you can be tired of them or you cannot it just depends on your preference I suppose now Shane Black uses a trope that I've been seeing pop up in Hollywood lately it's a newer one and that is that the lead character in the movie uh, played by an actor named Boyd Holbrook he is married to the always lovely Olivia Munn and he's a military guy so he's gone a lot and they have a son together and so it's up to Olivia Munn to take care of their son while he's gone and she's at home okay military family happens all the time well there's a switch to that and the switch is that their child is autistic he's portrayed as having autism why is that important in the movie well because later on in the movie apparently the heroes find some kind of uh, predator technology and of course they can't decipher the language it's not even from the planet earth so they don't even know what they're looking at well of course all it takes is for the autistic boy to come along and take a look at it and immediately he knows how to decipher it he knows what it means he knows how to read it maybe even speak it back I don't know so that is the trope that has been put in this movie and I say shame on you, Shane Black, for doing that. And I say shame on you, Hollywood, for 
promoting the idea that autism is a superpower that if you have autism you have you have some kind of special ability not to say that there aren't people or kids out there with autism that can do some of these things but the majority of them cannot what am I talking about I'm talking about movies that have autistic children in them or people who can look at the hardest math problem in the world that it's taken the top mathematicians in the world years and years or maybe decades to even get close to figuring it out and here comes along someone who has autism and they take a look at it for five minutes and they figure it out and just write it down or a child with autism is listening is having a real hard time adjusting to the surroundings around him or her and just listens to some kind of symphony and it it uh, awakens something in them and they go up to a piano never touched a piano before in their life but are magically able to reproduce everything that they just heard in the symphony or who a child who can or a person even who can just be able to understand a language or figure out a new language in a matter of hours or half an hour or whatever because their autism and their brain up here helps them to do that. Well, like I said, there are people who do that, but there are definitely not. And these movies who have these characters in them, they don't show you the rest of the problem, the rest of the life that these kids with autism should have. They don't show you the outbursts that the child will have if it's somewhere if he or she is somewhere where they're not familiar with or where they're not comfortable with or if there's too many people or if it's too loud or a combination of all of those things the outbursts and the meltdowns that cause everyone else who's around to look at them and look at the parents and start judging them why can't you take care of your kid why can't you teach him not to scream out like this what's wrong with you how are you a failure as a parent look at you they don't know they don't know they don't understand um, the movies don't show you or very rarely will show you any kind of problems that the child may have with social norms, social interacting. Staying out of personal space, not knowing that it's not okay to hurt somebody or that it is okay to return a greeting. They don't show you that. They don't show you how hard it could be to put that child to sleep. They don't show you the marital problems that can happen between husband and wife or whoever is married that might have an autistic child where it could be, you're gone a lot, you're not here to help me take care of this child and it's not easy, or I've done my share, why don't you do your share taking care of this child, it's so hard to do and I don't see you helping. And they don't show the self-blame that happens when you have a child who has autism. Did I do this to my child? Am I somehow guilty of doing something? Am I a terrible person and I brought this on my poor child and now they're stricken with this, with this is gonna be with them for the rest of their life, this, this personality disorder, if that's what you wanna call it. They don't show you those kind of things in the movies. Now autism is, they say it's a spectrum, a spectrum, a wide spectrum. I like to think of it more as a swimming pool. And there's a shallow end and there's a deep end. And there are all kinds of people in between. A lot of the times I would say a good portion of the population of the, of the entire world is somewhere in that swimming pool and they don't even know it yet. My wife likes to tell me that she suspects that I'm in there somewhere. I've had my suspicions too. Um, now, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a, a child psychologist. I don't, haven't done any studies on autism. I've taught a few students in my career with autism. They've always had workers with them to help them out. What makes me an expert? Well, what makes me an expert is that my son, my five-year-old son, has autism. So I'm very sensitive to this subject.
ever since we found out. The saddest day in my life, one of the saddest days in my life, and I've had a couple, one of the saddest days in my life was the day that I had to take, we had to take my son to the school district to get diagnosed. And I remember waking up that morning sad as possible. I remember going to him in his bedroom and waking him up, seeing him, and I start crying. And I hug him, and I tell him, I love you, son. You are my son. I love you, and I care for you, and I will always love you. And I don't care what anybody else says. You are my son. And feeling a little bit of heartbreak because he doesn't understand what I'm saying to him. This was about a year ago. Now, he had a very traumatic birth. Whether this contributes to him having autism, I don't know. Maybe. Probably. But his birth was very traumatic. Uh, he was basically stuck in the birth canal. He couldn't get out. There was an obstruction in the way. And it had been days since my wife's water had broke. And she tried and she tried and she tried to have it the regular way. To have him the regular way. And got so exhausted that by the end of the third day it was almost four days later I'm pretty sure it was a while ago and it was kind of traumatic for me too so I don't remember all of the details but I had to be the one to look at the doctors who were all just standing around and I this is something that I was upset with they were all just standing around staring at me while my wife was suffering and I looked at them pleading with them to do something it was my decision to have her give her the c-section and when the c-section was over and my wife was they were trying to sew her back up and my son was born and healthy that's when they discovered the obstruction nobody had seen it before he could not have gotten out other than a c-section we didn't know so he was stuck in there for a while so it was a very traumatic birth um, now thankfully if there's any kind of blessing with him having autism, it's that he is closer to the shallower end of the pool, like I like to say, or the other end of the spectrum, not the, not the deep end, but the, the shallower end. And what that means is that he is verbal, he's potty trained, but he's not verbal, he's not conversational, I should say. Those of you out there who have five-year-olds of your own, you know that they are going to ask questions about anything and everything under the sun. They're just going to go on and on because they want to understand the world around him. Well, my son doesn't. He doesn't do that. He will... He's getting better at talking, but he will repeat things that he's heard, and he will use those things to try and communicate. When he was younger and he wanted something to eat, he could not tell us what it is he wanted when he started talking. We would ask him, do you want macaroni and cheese? Do you want uh, crackers? Do you want a pouch? And this, those pouches of baby, pureed baby formula that you can squeeze out. Well, two years old, three years old, four years old, he wouldn't say, yes, I want that or mom, dad, can I have this? Or even just, can I have? Because us asking him what he wanted, do you want this particular thing? That's how he figured to get what he wanted. Do you want food? Do you want toy? Do you want whatever? That's how he would ask for things. And he still repeats things to this day, and he obsesses over things. Right now he's obsessed with a song that he sees on YouTube about the planets, the planets of the solar system. And for the past couple days, he will belt that song out any chance he gets, riding in the car behind me, when I pick him up from school, here at home. Now he has planets, we got him some little planet decorations for his bedroom. 
and lately he's been going in there and sitting down in his bed and staring at them and seeing the planets. And he's obsessed over different things in the past, shapes, continents, letters, numbers. He knows all of these things. He's smart enough to memorize them from when he was very little. And so now if his teachers ask him what shape is this, he'll be able to just take a quick look at it and be able to tell him that's a hexagon, that's a nonagon, that's an octagon, that's a square, that's a triangle. Even to the point that he knows 3D shapes, that's a rectangular prism. He knows continents, he knows his whole alphabet. He's beginning to understand that letters make sounds and those sounds are the beginning of words. Thankfully, he is potty trained. Some parents out there who have, whose children are autistic are not as lucky as we are, as me and my wife are, my wife and I are, when it comes to their children and autism. They're not as lucky. Their child may never be verbal, may never be potty trained. We had a very, very loving and very caring and very wonderful babysitter that we went to her last year, a couple of years ago, and we said, our son is not potty trained yet. And she said, don't worry about it. I'll figure it out. I can do it. And she did do it. And we were internally grateful to her for being able to teach him to, uh, to be potty trained. Now, he had a few accidents. But for the most part now, he'll be able to tell us if he needs to go potty, he'll be able to say, I need to go potty, and he'll go potty. Now, lately he's been prioritizing playing around with going to potty. I think that's just something that's usual with kids across the board, so I'm not too worried about that. Max was always difficult. My son was always difficult to put to sleep, to get him to go to sleep. By the time he was about three years old, when he still should have been taking naps, he was done with naps. He never wanted to do it again. To get him to go to sleep at night, I would have to go through uh, several steps. For one thing, I had to lay him down on the bed and swaddle him. Now, your parents know what swaddling means. It's basically you put your child down on a blanket and you wrap them up, kind of like a burrito. And you do it tight, sometimes tight, sometimes not. And it's supposed to simulate the sensation of being back in the womb and it's supposed to be comforting to your newborn or your toddler. I had to do it not for that reason, but to restrain his arms and his legs. I would wrap him up as tight as could be so he couldn't be able to fight back. I would go to the rocking chair and I would sit in the rocking chair and give him his milk. And when he was done with that, he would fight me. I would hold him sideways like this and he would be sideways in my arms. And I would hold him and I would rock back and forth to try and get him to calm down and he would fight and he would try and get his arms loose and sometimes he would succeed and one would go up in the air and his hand would be reaching like this he would be going for anything and I'd have to grab it and I'd have to pull it back down and hold on to him tight tight and then he would stop his struggling his legs would be kicking and I'd be holding his legs back with my arms and he would start to struggle a little less and a little less and he'd start to calm down and at that point I would put him on my shoulder and I knew he was calming down because I could feel his eyelashes blinking on my neck and his breathing. And I knew he was calming down because his blinking would get, there would be longer breaks between blinks until finally I would feel the eyelashes close and not open up again. And I wasn't done then because then I had to hold him with one arm and I had to go to his bed. Now, he never enjoyed sleeping in the crib. He hated his crib, never slept in it. And I would have to crawl carefully onto the bed with him and lay down with him on my chest. And he wasn't asleep yet. He was drowsy, he was getting there, but he wasn't asleep yet. And he didn't get there until I could tell he was asleep when his breathing started to even out and then I would very carefully roll over and lay him down next to me, get my arm out from under him and very carefully slide out the bed, stand up and leave the bedroom. 
I had to do this. This is a 45 minute to an hour ordeal for the majority of his toddler baby stages. They don't show you this in the movies. They don't show you that in the movies. The problems that come along. He doesn't know that it's not okay to hurt others sometimes. When he plays, he can be he can be violent. He can push or or hurt or pinch. Not doing it out of being mean. He just doesn't know that he's not supposed to do these things no matter how many times we tell him, "Max, you don't hurt other kids. You don't hurt your friends when you're playing with them." Don't do that. It's not nice. Um, he will scream if he doesn't get what he wants. Now, every kid screams and they'll, have, they'll throw fits. But there's a difference between a, a boy or a girl throwing a fit because they're not getting a toy to a boy or a girl who has autism throwing a fit, having an outburst, melting down. There's a difference between the two. Because a parent can step in for a child who doesn't have it and grab them and get the child's attention and say, you just wait till we get home or you cut that out right now. That sort of thing. You do that to a child who has autism and it's going to send them into the deep end even more. It's going to it's going to set them off even more and they're going to scream louder and they're going to scream higher. So these are the things that they don't show you in movies. The embarrassment of taking, having to take your child out of somewhere where you were a party or the store or the mall or somewhere, wherever, when they start to have a meltdown. He couldn't describe for the longest time, my son couldn't describe if something was happening. If I ask him how his day went, he won't be able to tell me. He'll just start singing his planet songs. If he was younger and he was sick and we went to the doctor and they asked him what hurt or where it hurt or what does he feel, he would never be able to tell them. He doesn't understand to describe things. If I ask him, what does it mean to be this? What, is it, what does this mean? What does it mean when two words sound the same? It rhymes. What does that mean? He'll get frustrated. He won't want to do anything. He didn't talk for almost three years, and it took him almost even longer than that just to say mama. He said daddy, but he didn't say mama. These are the things that they don't show you in these movies, in movies, in Hollywood. So shame on you, Hollywood. Shame on you for using these poor people, these children, these people um, just to further along a stupid plot as a tool to use in your movies shame on you for this shame on you Shane Black for writing it in your script and all you other writers and directors out there in Hollywood who see this very hard thing for people to go through and just see it as a way to sell tickets to make money shame on you for that I encourage you all out there to do a little research on autism and to try and understand it better because anyone out there can have it and anything can trigger somebody who has it and if you don't know to look for the signs you might not understand what this poor person is going through or why they are behaving the way they are so please go out there try and do a little education try and try and uh, do a little research to understand a little bit. So this video is a little shorter, but like I said, it's something that's important to me and my family and my son. Anthony Gonzalez, certifiable teacher. See you next time. Be safe out there.